Yeah, um, I've obviously not uh, found this, but I think was on the program that's supposed to be here. Uh, fortunately, he was in the telly, getting right to get on the plane, and got a high fever. Uh, was barred from traveling by 40, taken to the UN clinic there. Probably something malaria related, but <laughs> so it's a work here in Northern Canada. So yeah, he has not been able to travel. Uh, I got his presentation there, and uh, I'll try to uh, I tried to make sense of it, uh, most of it uh, <laughs> I understand. I mean, I'm also involved in the same project in Northern Uganda around yeah, associate crowdsourcing uh, data on non camp refugees in Northern Uganda with the South Sudanese refugee crisis. Uh, there are some slides I also don't fully understand, uh, so I'll just have a little fans if I can explain the question or whatever. Uh, I do think his intention in some places was to be a bit uh, you know, provocative. For some discussions, uh, uh, <coughs> just so we can be aware of that. But uh, we'll see how far we get. Uh, it will also mean, unfortunately, that I'll be reading a bit from the slides as well. So sorry for that in advance. Anyway, uh, as of uh, say about the start of this year, I have started work on a project uh, on the two largest refugee crises we have in the world at this moment, uh, split across Turkey, the Syrian refugee crisis. Uh, this well over a million Syrian refugees in, in Turkey and Uganda, where a lot of South Sudanese refugees have been crossing the border since about July 2016. Uh, uh, yeah, should be correct. There were a couple of thousand at that point in time, and this is absolutely skyrocketed. Um, so it's happened a couple of times already. Uh, uh, a new refugee camp has been opened in northern Uganda. And two months later, it's the biggest one in the world, yeah. So passing it down to Kuma, Kenyan camps. So, getting into that, uh, I think this visualizes, uh, what's that? let's see, how does this put together? Uh, South Sudan, lots of room for the both to the north, but also once you to Uganda. These are all figures as you can see, July. Uh, by now, we've passed uh, a million South Sudanese refugees in Uganda. Uh, and Uganda is not a big country, I mean it extends to like this, but it does basically mean that a lot of areas in northern Uganda are just being turned into refugee camps. Who does runs in it? Uh, yes. So you'll see there just pretty much uh, what's it called, say the land use there. Uh, in some of these districts, over 67% of the population is refugees at this moment. Most of quite well in Kampala, about 100,000 refugees in Kampala by now, uh, but most of them stay around in uh, Uganda. Uh, one difference to emphasize there is that in Uganda, this is sort of a choice. Uh, as opposed to, say, the situation in Kenya, in Uganda, refugees have a right to work, to travel, to move around. Uh, when they stick around in northern Uganda, they get a Russian car, they get food, they get taken care of. Uh, that's not the case when they travel outside of the area, but uh, in principle it's, it's quite liberal and they have quite a lot of rights. But this is how some of these camps look. Uh, when you drive through this, it's just a never ending stream of huts, human and short term, uh, also leading to conflicts, of course, with local populations. So uh, the refugee settlements are surrounded by, or encompassed in a lot of cases, uh, local villages which just have to. <laughs> yeah, be in one of the wrong location, but a location that's being swallowed up by huge refugee settlements. Uh, with yeah, also all the potential conflicts coming out of that. Uh, some of our staff uh, got a uh, portion of the structure in point tanks, uh, distribution point right the point there. Uh, so yeah, this is some of the headlines here. Uh, again, this policy towards refugees is the best of the world, yes. Uh, maybe uh, there's over a million of them right now, right now. Uh, but of course, this in the longer term, this does lead to tension uh, in the country for the size of Uganda. Uh, the Uganda population is about 45 million, and also a lot of those are suffering from lack of access to, to health services and education. Uh, when so a lot of refugees, which are in the views in the eyes of local population, being taken care of much better than their own communities, of course, this leads to, to issues in the long term. Um, which also UN and other agencies are trying to address, but also stepping up their efforts to um, 
provide access to local populations, but of course, there's potential for, for conflict there. Uh, so far, it's been incidents, but no major things. Um, there's a summit, so you get uh, Mr. Vitalis, uh, Secretary General there. Um, lots of say, fundraising also happening for UNSCR and for the uh, government to allow them to, to keep taking care of refugees in this, in this matter. So, one of the abbreviations you'll see quite a bit of these slides is OPM, which is the abbreviation of the Office of the Prime Minister, which is uh, the main uh, entity in the Ugandan government uh, in charge of. The refugee response. Um, and in Uganda, as part of the project uh, that I mentioned, uh, we start, it started out as sort of a, a research project, uh, which was approved around say, August, July, August 2016, and at which point there were well less than 100,000 South Sudanese refugees in Uganda. Uh, the intention is that we pilot how we could use OpenStreetMap data, open data, and to have an impact on the human terror response in Uganda. How we can use this data to improve data sharing across actors, across um, implementing partners. So what happens is UNHCR is taking the lead in response, but they're not doing all the work themselves. They split this up by sectors, so protection, livelihoods, health, uh, and contracts, NGOs to do parts of all this work. So, for example, there's Oxfam there, and there's uh, different branches of Red Cross, MSF is doing work there. Uh, but all these NGOs have their own ways of working, their own methods of collecting data, their own systems for storing data, uh, and cooperation and between NGOs often spotty. That's uh, data sharing. Uh, it it's, it's at the level of exchanging PDFs, paper maps, and that type of thing. Um, so our task or mandate there was to start exploring how we can use uh, open data platforms, uh, open street maps specifically, to um, use, get at least some basic data into a shared uh, operating platform which allows us to, to share data across organizations. And uh, for example, let everyone know there's uh, a certain amount of water points in a, re a refugee settlement and prevent someone else from building a latrine right next to it, um, which means you can you're supposed to scrap both these kinds of things. And these things happen a lot, by the way. So, um, so that's part of the, the, the problem statement here. There's uh, a lot of information still parts, uh, NGOs or UNHCR that has data for certain, uh, uh, certain items on wash. So water sanitation, health, uh, water points, uh, the drains, on protections, uh, uh, make sure everyone's uh, safe and sound in the camps, uh, uh, programs, libraries, etc. Uh, but a lot of this data is being kept in, well, you can imagine that things, uh, things have gone before the internet. It's also an, an area where there's no real uh, coverage. So at best, people will have a hard drive of some data somewhere, uh, and data sharing is really close to time um, right, this is mostly slide with a lot of um, issues uh, in coordination. Um, non IAC, uh, inter agencies, uh, even within UN, different agencies, there's little to no data sharing between WFP, UNFPA, UNHCR, as actors. Uh, no OSHA present in the Ghana. Uh, there is a uh, some coordination, but no OSHA. I think they caught you can about two years ago. Um, standard information, like the sector. So, a lot of people, for example, in NGOs responsible for water ponds, they'll have data on water ponds, but it's not put together with data on the trees, for example. A um, couple of others. Most immunity is somewhat of a, a concept unique to you, Uganda. Uh, I mean, that does not. Good. Usually, refugee camps are built in areas where you know there's no one else around. You just go and do a few and have a picnic there, and build camp. And it's usually not know much other people which uh, are affected by that. Not in not Uganda. I mean, it's sparsely populated, but a lot of villages are being swallowed up for a few secondary effects. Also due again due to the uh, the good open refugee policy. Also means people are free to just move to the city and go live in town. 
instead of in the refugee camp. Um, taking, well, taking jobs there, making use of, uh, of services. So, uh, Taylor management, um, what I there was, was not, say, uh, open your mission, but which also didn't have, say, the, the capacity and capability that had been outsourced. Um, which has an impact, of course, on decision making, uh, especially with the huge influx of refugees that we've seen since starting uh, this program. Once again, it was sort of meant to be a research program, but uh, the urgency of the situation has meant uh, uh, we've also got an say the opportunity to uh, also operationalize a lot of this data and get started on actually um, using and sharing it with the current refugee crisis. So uh, how we've been doing this is partly during uh, remote mapping, again using uh, Mount Street and Tooling. Um, of MSF, British Red Cross, us have been asking a lot of uh, volunteers to be mapping uh, of refugee camps. Uh, this is part of uh, Padolina, uh, one of the camps, and you'll see indeed that, yeah, it is, it is it, or just say bulldoze roads in uh, a flat area of northern Uganda. Well, Padolina, for example, just to give you an uh, example here, it's been suffering from a lot of uh, flooding in the wet season because no one thought to, to take elevation profiles into account. Um, and this little part um, contains about 6,000 households. Uh, we can digitizing off of uh, Medkit imagery through the State Department. Um, so that's one part of remote mapping, but then of course we need to enrich this information with um, information from the field from the scans. So who's operating what um, health education facilities there, uh, washing facilities, etc. So, Stefan and the team are working a lot on identifying gaps in information management and coordination, and seeing how we can standardize the tools and data collection across, across actors and implement partners, uh, seeing what parts we need to coordinate to, to start sharing it. Uh, not really more on different types of data here. Uh, so, how to decide what tools they use. Uh, all organizations want to involve uh, refugee host communities. And so uh, to me that it's also a bit of a water, but uh, to directly involve beneficiaries in your program itself and that's uh, getting more accepted uh, in the as well. Uh, but there's been a lack of guidelines, coordination, best practices. Uh, some concerns with NGOs uh, doing their things apparently as the headline uh, in Paris. Um, also OPM of course um, the Uganda government is trying to take a lot of ownership for managing coordinated situations. They're very sensitive to everything that uh, who's the bad line or you know answers questions, inconvenient questions at times, even though for, uh, for example also you know, very simple things such as population estimates, how many refugees are there exactly. Uh, if some estimates are more lower than others, then I mean, the higher ones are better for fundraising for PR, etc. So, uh, there's always tension between, again, with, with data, open data, and who can collect what and for what purposes, etc. Uh, there's also a lot of, I think, uh, there's a small quote in the bottom right there which uh, is cut off, and I don't know who to attribute it to, but I think what <laughs> it implies, yeah. <laughs> Uh, a, a big problem is that uh, uh, you have to deal with a lot of well, amateur humanitarian organizations, um, not in the sense that they don't know what they're doing, but that from our perspective, so, uh, they often don't really work with data uh, at all. Uh, they're very good at, for example, taking care of uh, what they're contracted to do in a humanitarian response, you know, managing uh, wash infrastructure, etc. But they don't necessarily know how to um, properly use data to, to for example, uh, think uh, where to place these installations, how to relate uh, sediment, household information to current coverage of, of facilities and services, and how to properly think of where to uh, build new infrastructure, and also how to work with other organizations to make sure you, yeah, you don't do double work uh, to, well, uh, 
but it actually effectively used there in, in decision making. Uh, so this is a bit of a puzzle for me as well. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, <coughs> um, what we've started at doing uh, is to, at first to provide a bilateral, so direct support to uh, other organizations uh, to make sure you, you know, just transfer some skills, some awareness, some knowledge on mapping, on the use of data, on map literacy, just the basic stuff. Easy to do, uh, but what often will happen is that uh, they'll say, thank you. Uh, and it won't have a big overall impact on coordination data sharing across organizations. Um, so to that end, and you see a couple of slides down, what has been happening is that we've been working with UNHCR to set up an overall information management uh, platform team uh, to make sure we can actually not just be supporting individual hand-picked organizations. And then I don't mean MSF or Red Cross who know what they're doing, uh, basically, but say, Smaller NGOs um, who have may not have much, one of GS officers and staff, certainly not in country. Um, they're really reliant on others to tell them what to do, where and how, in some cases, in terms of using data. Um, so that's the shorter term strategy. Also, I mean, it's helpful because you also build skills and capability in these NGOs. Uh, longer term, you'd uh, also want it is to be a set of best practices adopted by all NGOs and you can actually sort of force people to start working in a common platform uh, instead of you being the single point of contact for everyone and everyone's different you and you're the one that needs to do the heavy lifting. So um, Stefano and uh, we've really stepped into field work uh, about four months ago. Uh, this one's a bit busy, that's a code for a second. We're now allowed to, to uh, from OPM and uh, UNHCR, to be operating <coughs> in uh, the refugee service host communities, which is a big step and quite selective, and that you really need to prove what your business is, what your added value is. Uh, Start um, deploying OpenStreetMap tools, uh, data collection uh, with a couple of number of NGOs. Uh, so you see MSF, CRS, REACH, Oxfam uh, Red Cross, uh, Danish Refugee Council, Center for Children, uh, and started setting up an IM working group with UNHCR, REACH, uh, Geotech is a local Ugandan uh, geo company. Uh, had a number of other funds uh, working with field data collection together with REACH, and uh, really started to do place on the street map. Uh, the, one of the main data sources in the refugee response. And of course, uh, from protection point of view, you need to be careful what data to put in there. There's a lot of data not suited, per se, to OpenStreetMap, especially when you get more to, uh, say, household survey data, that type of thing. Uh, but for basic data on just the availability, uh, the presence of services, of shelter, of housing, etc., uh, it's a big step up from the previous situation, which is couple of printed PDF maps that everyone's supposed to just uh, use in some way. And we've had a lot of refugees, a lot of refugees, a number of refugees attending map phones, also learning some of student skills. Uh, in addition to people from those communities, uh, we're developing uh, or working on standardizing data collection using Open Data Kit, uh, since that's a tool that's already in use, being used by a lot of Unitary organizations also in this setting, and working on more unitary maps, actual aids in decision making. So I think this is one of the mobile phones. Uh, I know this is the first uh, official UNHR mobile phone, but it could be. Uh, I don't know where these are, so sorry for that. Probably uh, Arua, Yumbe, somewhere not in Uganda. Uh, I think this gentleman is the, 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 the head of uh, our, uh, an association of host communities, uh, the, the villages which have been swallowed up by the refugee settlements have also started sort of organizing and more advocating for their rights and claiming the place for, say, their, their population and, you know, not getting swapped up in the mayhem and, and uh, making sure that they also benefit from uh, increased level of services, etc. 
uh, which is of course something you mentioned also wants to, to ensure uh, to make sure there's no, no tension service over there. Um, so I think we have an agreement with uh, so starting to get agreements in place with those communities to start the mapping and tracking and uh, development of services. So they also know what's happening, what's new, uh, what is the coverage of these new services, etc. How does this compare to the services in RPG settlements as well? Um, Jeffrey collecting data, and then you get a, a watch, well, water point. And I think some of the outputs that were starting to uh, deliver more on, say, both the road networks, combination with, uh, as it say, water tanks, water tanks, wash facilities, uh, that type of thing in, in 50 refugee settlements, which is close to the PDB. Another one which sort of shows also any one of the any map surface from this to a certain extent, but it's sometimes a bit extreme and obscure, but especially when a situation which is very fluid where uh, a lot of development and changes are in the countryside. So uh, this is a site for which we do the proper imagery, uh, all the work that works about, etc. <laughs> we don't for this part, yeah. <laughs> so Sorry. this is something which is probably uh, soon enough. Uh, this is uh, a new camp which they just opened, I think, last month. So there's been some mapping done already here, uh, field work on wash facilities. There we have road reports, but we need to make sure that we get the full, uh, you know, the, the full map of the camp on uh, uh, proper level of detail. So again, uh, of course, the new one. This is part of development, I would say, more tool to also um, start keeping track better of the status of, for example, wash facilities. It's very simple, I think you're calling it a thing, and I think it's just a spreadsheet, OEK-based, and we the status of facilities and starting to keep track of this at the base, get a higher level across across actors. Uh, some challenges, indeed. Uh, <laughs> We're working to, to address uh, just that. And, uh, we just have a couple of people <laughs> in Uganda. Uh, that's what we can afford at the moment. Uh, but demands are vastly outgrowing uh, the capacity of our team at the moment. So, something we're working to address. And time. Uh, roads are not the best. Uh, this is a pretty big. If you drive through one of the sectors of BDB, you can spend hours driving for one of those. And you just You'll think you're out of it, but because you have a bit of shrubbery, and then next thing you know, there's you and a short tar popping up again through the, through the woods. Uh, lots of tasks, long distances. Uh, often, we're the ones that are coordinating between even different parts of the same NGO, uh, which is maybe not ideal, but when you want to get stuff done, you know, you're taking all these type of things, and you've got to be careful that. You're not, you don't end up being the communication process of other uh, ideas in front of And this is the files. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think what it means here is that uh, a lot of our projects are focused more on either supporting other NGOs uh, in making in support in uh, uh, getting data for refugee response and for uh, disaster response, while we've not uh, traditionally been right in the middle of these operations ourselves. Uh, this is something that we're uh, sort of learning how to do, uh, but at least the has a lot of uh, experience there with our chat with, uh, with Emma. So this is from his perspective, kind of challenge how to find out how to properly use the OpenStreetMap ecosystem and tooling, uh, the model, the map of fonts, for example, the field mapping we have been doing, and how to translate that to a UN setting where we're being looked at as the people who are actually operationalizing this data. Uh, yeah, so some of the messages uh, really starting to be positioned in you can as, as the main uh, information management player there, uh, coordinating between the jails, etc. So, yeah, uh, big job. Uh, uh, we're going into the second year of a grant uh, this month. This is running into September 2018, and a lot of work to do before the time, uh, setting up best practices, and 
getting open source, open source tooling more ingrained in the operations of of the implement part of that. So that's it. Uh, hope it was. Uh, <laughs> challenge there is just finding where people are because it's tend to sort of disappear into the city, into the fabric of, of life there, which is already there. Um, so yeah, that, that's one of the main challenges there. Uh, at the other hand, people in it who are in the city already have, almost by definition, bad access to services. I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff happening there. They quickly form new communities there, often based on the same, say, uh, the same uh, conditions they're from. So, tend to see that people from the same religion or city in, in Syria tend to congregate in specific areas of, of Istanbul. Uh, so yeah, part of the, 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 uh, the project is also to sort of compare the value of, of the street map uh, uh, open data in both settings, more the rural and more the urban uh, setting, and what value can you bring to, to both the situations. And what we're noticing there is that uh, in the more rural setting, well, say began when where there's large refugee camps, a lot of refugees, and also a lot of NGOs responding to that. The main challenge is more on the NGO side, and how to set up proper, say, food distribution or um, development of infrastructure. While in the cities, the challenge is more on getting refugees to be aware of what's available to them. Um, so there's much more supply in, in the cities, um, but refugees are often not very uh, aware of what they can access in terms of legal services, in terms of health, for education. Uh, first, have not been asked to try and solve this problem at all. Have you been able to talk to you using OpenStreetMap in the kind of mapping of IDPs with disability to the families? Yeah, yeah. In Istanbul, we, we mostly use say, other NGOs' data, but that have already been doing this work in the city. I mean, it's really hard to. I mean, we can, of course, but it's really hard to data. You can't just put that on OpenStreetMap like here. There's no one's here. <laughs> of this and this religion from this city. So uh, we're trying to focus on Istanbul more on say, infrastructure and helping people navigate life down. So what legal services they can access and how those can we map out public transport there better so people can get around and also uh, do that in Reddit so um, they can actually get around in their own language and uh, find a way there. But um, in, in this specific project, um, we found that, I mean, Turkey is a, it's so different, not just in say the setting, or it was rural, but also operating environment and the involvement of government in uh, in response. So in that sense, uh, there's actually a bit more, say, different variables than there's just the urban rural uh, difference. Yeah. Um, um, how exactly are you collecting this data in uh, OSS because in, in the hot data model, uh, you can tag. Uh, IDP tabs or camps actually, mm -hmm. but uh, this tag is not used. So how do you reflect this information really in OSM? Yeah, uh, so we've been working on, on a different data model here. I mean, there's a, not really such a thing as hot tagging. Uh, there's OpenStreetMap tagging, which yeah. is pretty flexible uh, for all. There have been some examples of mapping in, in refugee camps before. So Andrew Dare has been involved in doing this in, in Jordan, for Zagadi. Uh, people have met in camps, Katja has been doing this, uh, for example, Colette, uh, <coughs> camps. 
so those sort of um, there, there are a couple of brief pages for say proposed tagging for for uh, for refugee camp settlements in Australia, uh, but there's also uh, a lot lacking there. So for example, we there's no specific tag for say food distribution points. But also we are uh, creating some say new ones for which mostly fit our use there at the moment. But also seeing how this can feed back into more standardized OZM tagging for refugee camps in the long yeah, just to, just to comment on that, I mean, we, years ago in Jordan with UNHCR, um, I was working with REACH at the time, we had... Sorry, can you speak up a little bit? I'm sorry, yeah. We, there's a wiki page that was just tailored specifically for mapping Azraq and Zatari refugee camps in Jordan. Um, that was done under the auspices of UNHCR, like they had approved the open opening up of data for those camps. You know, from a protection standpoint, that is you know, available. Um, and then, but that was that was tailored specifically. And when I was in Uganda with Paul, you know, in July, I, I showed that, and it's it's wildly out of date, or it's not complete for for a different context. And then we found out that there was another similar documentation done for you know the Red Cross during the, uh, the European uh, crisis, or the, the crisis in Europe, and so it was different. But it should be updated because as this becomes more and more common. Uh, it's, a, it's a useful uh, guidance tool. So, yeah, we, we are having conversations with you and HR at different levels and also different offices. Uh, they're actually quite interested in getting this sort of a standardized tagging for, for refugee situations. Yeah, at the at the Geneva level, you and HR is working on sort of. Uh, it's not based on open street map, but they're working on a sort of global portal for settlement maps and they have like a typology for how they're naming them and conventions for, for different things like that. But that, that'll, I mean, they can ostensibly in, in case by case basis ingest OSM data for those camps when it's created, but it'll be a, you know something for a camp planner or a site planner to use and things like that. So from what I understand. Yeah. Um, so I mean, how do you do the shutdown mapping? Do you use remote sensing or do you do data collection? Sorry, I, I, I like made that remote sensing. Yeah, like to map the shelters that you need or shelters, do you do it based on the satellite imagery? Or yeah, do you feel yeah. That that yeah, it's mostly based on the, the imagery we are getting from Blackhead, so also for the State Department, uh, made part of Because uh, So that, that's the imagery that uh, Alison and, uh, and MSF have also been using to, to set up a bunch of the tasks. Uh, so we should be able, we're practically able to get very up to date data for these camps, for these areas. Uh, again, because the situation is so incredibly dynamic now, we're talking about an increase of 900,000 refugees within a year. All these camps are basically newer than a year, so you really need information or imagery from, say, yesterday in order to be, to be able to, to properly map these areas. Uh, because actually, like when we did the first mapping of Hume with uh, MSF, we did some satellite imagery, which was like not very old, but we purchased for it, but like just after we did it, it was already outdated because yeah. the shelters are moving so fast. Uh, yeah. So we asked ourselves if it was a good use of volunteer resources to do mapping, like detailed mapping of shelters. We do, like, we do an OSM if like, everything will move in two or three months. Yeah, so what we're moving towards more is uh, actually doing, say, an initial mapping more at, at the point that the camps are open. So these camps have sort of a life cycle. So they're open, they fill up the capacity, they close, they start a new camp. So actually do this at two points in time, uh, one when the camp is being open, and uh, that means that the basic infrastructure is there, the roads, uh, some of the shelter, a uh, bunch of infrastructure, etc. Then do more field mapping, and then at the end, more towards the end of the, the camp, say, well, the life cycle, but <laughs> because it's going to be existing a lot longer, but when it's about to close down, uh, the shelters are, uh, the situation with shelters is much more stable and then do not pass to upgrade the shelter. Yeah, this is all work to the formal refugee camp. Yeah. Uh, these are all formal. Yeah. Although, yeah, once again, people are sort of free to move, move in about, in, uh, around, the, around the country. Um, so there are set also satellites, not really camps, but um, so informal satellites starting to appear, uh, for example, Guru and Arua. And this, this major city is closer to the refugee camps. The big ones are. 
what do you do for temporary shelters, like a semi, not a tent, but something slightly more? Is there efforts to remove structures from militia? Well, it depends on what Or is it just like legacy carcasses of, of the... Camps. Yeah. Well, that's a, I think that's, that's a question for us. I was at Amazon Hall, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I think in general, it's, it's what you see happening a lot is that people are way less more willing to add stuff than to take it away because uh, are you going to check if it's actually still there or if it's moved away? So uh, that's a long term question. At this point, the camps and those at some point in time. Uh, ostensibly, these camps and the whole refugee situation, of course, the presence of South Sudanese and Uganda is temporary, but it's going to take. Uh, I mean, the cost of these have been there. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you look at it, yeah. it's yeah. Kenya. Yeah. 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 Yeah.